So uh, in the last chapter, the last chapter of the third volume of Marx's Capital bears a promising title, Classes. Marx opens this chapter by listing, by listing the three great classes of modern society based upon capitalist mode of production, wage laborers, capitalists, and landowners. He proceeds by posing an important question, what constitutes a class? However, a couple of paragraphs later, the chapter suddenly ends, leaving the reader without a satisfying answer. Um, unfortunately, Marx was unable to finish the third volume of Capital and the chapter on classes during his lifetime. Hence, even though Marx's theoretical opus contains numerous sporadic references on classes and class struggle, it does not contain a coherent and elaborate theory of classes. The first objective of the pen is to tackle the question that was left unanswered by Marx <coughs> and asks what uh, constitutes a class in capitalist society. Our intent here is not to inquire into what historically constituted the classes by way of ex explaining their historical genesis and the de development, but rather to look into pe peculiarities of the underlying social relations that stru structurally constitute classes within what Marx calls the inner organization of capitalist mode of production in its ideal average. Particularly, we will be interested in the specific social form assumed by the antagonistic relations between classes in a capitalist society and in the distinct nature of class domination entailed by this form. The second, second objective of the panel is to examine some of the contemporary notions of classes and class struggle in the works of post-Marxist theorists and bourgeois sociologists. The prevailing idea in this current is that the Marxian concept of class and class struggle are anachronistic and incapable of grasping the social relations in con contemporary society. Moreover, Marx's concepts of class, class and class struggle are seen as an integral part of his supposedly crude economic reductionism. By way of returning to Marx's original text, we will critically scrutinize these contemporary theories and ideologies. Um, well, I guess it's time now to give floor to our speakers. First speaker is Chris Kane. Chris uh, he recently completed his PhD in social and political thought at the University of Sussex. He specializes in social and political philosophy and continental philosophy, philosophy with a particular focus on Marx, Marxism and critical theory. He's currently writing a book on social constitution and social domination in Marx, Hegelian Marxism and value form theory, as well as uh, several articles that develop points from his PhD thesis. He's also editing the selected writings of Alfred Sloan Rattle. His other research interests include humanism, anti-humanism, negative humanism and critical theories of crisis. So, Chris, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers, the participants, and everyone who came. Uh, so, basically, my paper just attempts to address sort of the first aspect of the abstract that was read. Uh, I offer sort of no groundbreaking uh, thesis. It's mostly just a close reading of Marx in, at the end of volume three. So hopefully everyone likes Marx. If not, I'm, I don't know, the exit's that way, I suppose. <laughs> okay. As Paul Maddock Jr. notes, Rolf Derendorf's class in conflict in modern society provides a cogent, if overly dramatic, summary of the status of class theory and capital. Quote, Marx postponed the systematic presentation of his theory of class until death took the pen from his hands. The irony has often been noted that the last 52nd chapter of the last third volume of Capital, which bears the title The Classes, has remained unfinished. After a little more than one page, the text ends, the lapidary remark of its editor, Engels. Here, the manuscript breaks off. Well, Durendorf's comments might be taken to demonstrate that capital lacks a theory of class, or that it remained unfinished. It can also be interpreted as alluding to two points that can be drawn on in order to provide a more in-depth perspective on this issue. The distinction that Marx draws between his systematic method of presentation and his method of investigation, and the role that Engels played as the editor of volume three. Taking these points into account, 
Well, it must be acknowledged that Marx did not provide a systematic presentation of class and capital or a coherent and elaborate theory of classes. Elements of a definition can still be drawn from his accounts of the inner organization of the capitalist mode of production and its ideal average. And this is particularly the case if Heinrich's point is taken into consideration that Engel's edition of the third volume of Capital made significant modifications to the segmentation of Marx's 1864 to 1865 manuscript. As Heinrich notes, two of these modifications consisted in turning the seven chapters in Marx's manuscript into seven parts, consisting of 52 chapters, further divided into a number of sections, and as well as erroneously assembling the order of the manuscripts of what became chapter 48 of volume three on the Trinity formula. As Heinrich points out, this means that in Engel's edition of volume three, readers can no longer tell at what point in the manuscript presentation turns into inquiry. Moreover, it also means that the inquiry marks conducted in this manuscript is separated into a number of different chapters, dividing the train of Marx's thought. Consequently, as my paper will try to show, reading part seven as a single chapter, rather than five separate chapters, and putting the Trinity formula in its correct order can provide non-systematic answers to the questions that Marx poses in the fragmentary section on the classes that follows these separate chapters in Engel's edition of volume three. As I will demonstrate, the answers to these related questions, what makes a class and what makes wage laborers, capitalists, and landowners the formative elements of the great social classes can be found by examining Marx's account of the essential roles they play in the historically specific form of capitalist social production, wherein the preconditions that established it, the expropriation of the workers from the conditions of labor, the concentration of these conditions in the hands of a minority of individuals, the exclusive ownership of the land by other individuals, are reproduced by the social relations which constitute society, and with it these classes, as embodiments and personifications of the specific social form of the dominant production process of capitalist valorization. Before proceeding to these points, a few words about the object of Marx's investigation and the difference between his method of presentation and mode of inquiry. Rather than capital advocating a particular type of political economy, Marx describes capital as concerned with the critique of economic categories, or if you like, a critical expose of a system of bourgeois economy that is at once an expose and a critique of a system. The object of Marx's investigation is thus a twofold critique of the system of bourgeois economy, i.e capital, and the discipline of political economy. As Marx indicates in his letter to Kugelman, the theory of value that Marx provides, which serves as the mean through which he provides this critique, concerns the historically specific manner in which society aggregates labor, or in the form in which this proportional distribution of labor asserts itself in a state of society in which the interconnection of social labor expresses itself as the private exchange of the individual products of labor, is precisely the exchange value of these products. Moreover, as Marx also indicates in this very same letter, his critique of political economy has a different approach, approach and method of investigation than political economy. Where science comes in is to show how the law of value asserts itself. So if one wanted to explain from the outset all phenomena that apparently contradict the law, one would have to provide the science before the science. And it's precisely Ricardo's mistake that in the first chapter on value, all sorts of categories that still have to be arrived at are assumed as given. 
in order to prove their harmony with the law of value. Now, as the first part of this quote demonstrates, Marx's critique of political economy is thus concerned with showing how the law of value asserts itself. And the second part refers to Marx's particular method for doing so. This method concerns the distinction that Marx makes between presentation and inquiry. Whereas inquiry concerns the object of Marx's critique of political economy, how this historically specific character of social labor takes on the form of exchange value and asserts itself as a law of value. Presentation does not simply display the results of these investigations, but as in Heinrich's words, as indicated in Marx's comments on Ricardo's mistake, the factual correlation of the conditions presented should be expressed by the correct presentation of the categories by advancing from the abstract to the concrete. So this brings us back to the issue of class. As already indicated, the fragment on class that makes up chapter 52 of Engel's edition of volume three does not arrive at a definition of class that accords with this notion of presentation. Hence, there is not a systematic class that corresponds to it. However, a definition of class can be provided that answers the questions Marx poses by examining how the three classes that Marx identifies as the formative elements of the great social classes take part in the historically specific, specific way that society aggregates labor according to the law of value. This can be done by examining Marx's account of revenue and its sources. As was previously mentioned, Engel's edition of volume three separates this material into five different chapters and also gets the order of the first chapter in the Trinity formula wrong. This is not to sort of blame Engels uh, he did a much better job than most people would have done under the circumstances, especially if you've ever seen Marx's handwriting. Like, I could, yeah, I, I'd be lost myself. In Marx's manuscripts, these individual chapters are five different parts of one chapter, consisting in a five-part investigation of revenue and its sources, which proceeds from the Trinity formula as the forms of revenue in which social labor appears to uncover how social labor appears in these forms of revenue. In many ways, this investigation also marks the incomplete culmination of capital. It is thus presupposed on the preceding argument of the first two volumes, that the account of the perverted topsy-turvy world presented in this section as the complete mystification of the capitalist mode of production, the conversion of social relations into things the direct coalescence of the material re production relations with their historical and social determination, consisting in the most concrete elaboration of Marx's account of the inner organization of capitalist production. Perhaps something we can bring up in the discussion is the fact that he also brackets the world market here. Uh, and that raises the question of how this might relate to the idea of class composition and the periphery. This means that while the presentation of class is lacking at the end of the section, the materials that precede it is in many ways the most fully realized account Marx provides of how the law of value asserts itself. In the historically specific form of social labor, that it appears in the estranged outward appearances of economic relations in the revenue streams of land, rents, capital, interest, and labor wages. This is first evident in Marx's comments on the trans-historical and historically specific dimensions of labor. Marx holds that just as the savage must wrestle with nature to satisfy his wants, to maintain and reproduce life, so must civilized man and he must do so in all social formations and under all possible <coughs> modes of production. Thus, trans-historically, to the extent that the labor process is solely a process between man and nature, its simple elements remain common to all social forms of development. 
Therefore, it is the specific historical form of this trans-historical process that constitutes society. For the aggregate of these relations, in which the agents of this production stand with respect to nature and to one another, and in which they produce is precisely society, considered from the standpoint of its economic structure. Consequently, like all its predecessors, the capitalist process of production proceeds under definitive material conditions, which are, however, simultaneously the bearers of definitive, definite social relations, entered into by individuals in the process of reproducing their life. These conditions, like these relations, are on the one hand prerequisites, on the other hand results in creations of the capitalist process of production. They are produced and reproduced by it. Thus capitalism is a histori historically specific manner in which people interact with nature and each other, constituting and reproducing society as capitalist society. Chapter 7 also elaborates what distinguishes the capitalist social form of production from other forms. Marx characterizes its historical specificity as the result of a double separation. In the first instance, the historical process of primitive accumulation consists in the expropriation of the workers from the condition of labor. In the second, production is separated from circulation. The so-called relations of distribution correspond to and arise from historically particular and specific social forms of the production process and of the relationships with men which men enter into among themselves. Marx also enumerates the role of money in this particular capitalist social form. As he argues, money arises from and facilitates these peculiar characteristics of capitalism and the relation between capitalist and wage laborer, the money relation, the relation of buyer and seller, becomes a relation inherent in production itself. But this relation rests fundamentally on the social character of production. Capital, as valorizing value, thus stems from these social relations, constitutive of the specific separations and of the social power that money possesses by virtue of these separations. As Marx says, capital is not a thing, but rather a definitive social production relation belonging to a definite, definite historical formation of society, which is manifested in a thing and lends this thing a specific social character. These very same conditions mean that capitalist production is distinguished from the outset by two characteristic features. The first is that it produces its products as commodities. The second is the production of surplus value as the direct aim and determining motive of production. As I will now show, it is these characteristic features that signal what makes wage laborers, capitalists, and landowners formative elements of the three great, great social classes in capitalist production. For as Marx's critique of the Trinity formula reveals, these three classes do not simply make up the three separate revenue sources in the capitalist mode of production. Their formative elements are due to the essential roles these three classes play in the particular manner that capitalist society is constituted and reproduced by how these agents of production stand with respect to nature and to one another, and how these social relations lead to the emergence of value, its separation into these revenue streams, and the manner in which it asserts itself as a natural law that transforms the individuals within these relations into personifications of these relations. These essential roles are established by this very same process of primitive accumulation that provides the capitalist social form of production of its unique character. As Marx states, capital itself and landed property, which it includes
concludes as its antithesis already presupposes a distribution, the expropriation of the laborer from the conditions of labor, the concentration of these conditions in the hand of a minority of individuals, and the exclusive ownership of lands by other individuals. In short, all the relations which have been described in the part dealing with primitive accumulation. The double separation that characterizes the capitalist social form of production thus ensures that the transhistorical metabolic interaction with nature occurs by virtue of the peculiar interaction with nature established by these conditions, which also establishes the peculiar social relations in which these agents stand with one another. Thus, the confrontation of produced conditions of labor and the products of labor generally as capital for the direct producers implies from the outset a definite social character of the material conditions of labor in relation to the laborers, and thereby a definite relationship in which, to which they enter for the owners of the means of production and among themselves during the production itself. The transformation of these conditions of labor into capital implies in turn the expropriation of the direct producers from the land and thus a definitive form of landed property. Consequently, the changed form of the conditions of labor, i.e. alienated from labor and confronting it independently, whereby the produced means of production are thus transformed into capital and the land into monopolized land or property. This form belonging to a definite historical period thereby coincides with the existence and function of the produced means of production and of the land and the process of production in general. As a result, wage labor and landed property, like capital, are historically determined social forms one of labor, the other of monopolized terrestrial, the monopolized terrestrial globe. And indeed, both forms correspond, in, correspond to capital and belong to the same economic formation of society. The ensuing process of valorization slash reproduction is thus premised on these conditions and occurs through these relations. Capital, of course, pumps the surplus labor which is represented by surplus value and surplus product directly out of the laborers. Furthermore, although landed property has nothing to do with the actual process of production, Marx states that the landlord plays a role in the capitalist process of production, not merely through the pressure he exerts upon capital, nor merely because landed property is a prerequisite and a condition of capitalist production, since it is a prerequisite and condition of the expropriation of the labor from the means of production, but particularly because he appears as the personification of one of the most essential conditions of production. Finally, the laborer in the capacity of owner and seller of his individual labor power receives a portion of the product under the label of wages, in which that portion of their labor appears which we call necessary labor, i.e. that required for the maintenance and reproduction of this labor power. Finally, there is one more peculiar feature of the sui generis reality of the capitalist social form. This process of valorization and reproduction is according to a social dynamic already implicit in the commodity, and even more so in the commodity as a product of capital. The reification of the social features of production and the personification of the material foundations of production, which characterize the entire capitalist mode of production. Consequently, the principal agents of this mode of production itself, the capitalist and the wage laborer, are as such merely embodiments, personifications of capital and wage labor, definite social characteristics stamped upon individuals by the process of social production. The products of these definite social production relations, well, a landowner is merely a personification of land. Therefore, the entire determination of value and the regulation of the total 
production by value results, not from the conscious striving of any individuals or classes, but from the social form itself. The law of value thus asserts itself because, in this entirely specific form of value, labor prevails on the one hand solely as social labor, on the other hand, the distribution of the social labor, and the mutual supplementing and interchanging of its products, the subordination under and introduction into the social mechanism are left to the accidental and mutually nullifying motives of individual capitalists. However, since the latter confront one another only as commodity owners, and everyone seeks to sell his commodity as dearly as possible, the inner law enforces itself only through the competition, the mutual pressure on one another, whereby the deviations are mutually counseled and canceled. Only as an inner law, vis-a-vis the individual agents, as a blind law of nature, does the law of value exert its influence here and maintain the social equilibrium of production amidst its accidental fluctuations. This is my conclusion. Thus the owners of mere labor power, the owners of capital, and the landowner make up the formative elements of the capitalist mode of production because they are essential to the inner organization of the capitalist mode of production. By virtue of the role they play in the specific manner that the capitalist social form of production undertakes the trans-historical activity of labor, and in the manner by which the specific type of activity is reproduced by them through these relations. This implies that Marx conceived of class as a relational category, inherent to the particular manner in which the capitalist social form constituted and reproduced itself, the class is conceived as the specific social characters that the social production process stamps on individuals as products of the specific social relation of production. While this does not provide a systematic definition of class, I believe it more or less demonstrates how he conceived of classes in regard to his object of investigation. Why he, held up, why he held off systematically defining class, because it was necessary to show how classes were constituted by the social form prior to defining them, and why labor power, the owners of capital, and the landowner make up the great classes of modern society based on the capitalist mode of production. It might also serve to stress that question of class composition should be thought in relation to a form analytic and social relational perspective, and that the other elements of the classes should be unpacked from this perspective of how they participate within the structural dynamic. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, we'll thank you. Um, we have discussion afterwards. Um, right now, uh, Giving the floor to Tibor Ruta. Tibor is uh, um, Tibor has completed a master's in political theory and is currently a PhD student in the Sociology of Faculty of Arts, University of Ghana. He is uh, a member of Institute for Labor Studies and a member of Initiative for Democratic Socialism. His main topic uh, of interest is social theory from the perspective of historical materials. Uh, I guess we'll hear more about that right now, people of the tourists. Thank you, Martin. Uh, okay, uh, I hope you'll excuse me. I'll be talking a bit uh, quicker than Chris because I've got a lot to say and I don't have much time to say it in. And um, I'll just skip uh, the introduction and go straight to outlining the main claims of my uh, presentation and we'll go on from there. So in the first part of my talk, I'll present the essential components of a Marxian theory of class and I'll also say something about uh, why it is sensible that exactly these components form a Marxian theory of class. I'll defend that both on exegetical as well as theoretical grounds. In the second part, I'll address two of the most prominent critiques of a Marxian theory of class. The first one comes primarily from the post-structuralist perspective. 
this is the culturalist assertion that we cannot separate material interests from their discursive or political articulation. The second critique comes primarily from the Weberian sociologists, such as Anthony Gillens. The critique is basically that for the analysis of pre-capitalist societies, we need to substitute Max Weber for Marx because the latter was economically reductionist and being economically reductionist is, at least so Giddens implies, permissible only for the analysis of capitalist societies. Okay, so the bedrock of a Marxian theory of class is, in my reading at least, the concept of social property relations. Property relations are the real, not just the juridical, but the real relations of distributions of distribution of the means and conditions of production. That is, the distribution of technology, raw materials, machines, land, means of labor, and so on. This real or actual distribution of the means and conditions of production is, obviously, inseparably conjoined with the distribution of the control over them. If this is true, this implies the existence of and the unequal distribution of appropriative power that is, the ability to extract and appropriate surplus wealth from the immediate producers. Now, if social, if social property relations are distributed unequally, as they are by definition in every class society, this gives rise uh, to what we can call class relations. Class relations are relations between at least two groups of social agents, a group that possesses the means and conditions of production and a group that possesses them only relatively, or not at all. Um, now, for exegetical reasons, let me quote Marx from the Grundrisse. He says that before distribution can be the distribution of products, it is first the distribution of the instruments of production, that is, the distribution of the means of production, and second, which is a further specification of the same relation, the distribution of the members of the society under specific relations of production. Now, what Marx is saying here is that the unequal distribution of the means of production determines the unequal distribution or subsumption, as he calls it, uh, of agents, of social agents, under different social relations of production. Now, what are social relations of production? These are simply the relations um, uh, into which people enter in the course of their reproduction of themselves and the society. Now, what kinds of social relations of production agents enter is, therefore, determined by the property relations into which they are embedded. As Marx says in the passage I just cited, relations of production are just a further specification of the same relation. This same relation is obviously social property relation. Now, on this basis, as I pointed out, at least two groups of social agents are formed. The exploiters, that is, those who live by coercively extracting wealth from others, and the exploited, that is, those who produce the wealth that is taken from them coercively by the exploiters. Now, to give you two, just two examples, and we'll come back to that, uh, feudal property relations are relations between absolute owners and the relative owners of the means and conditions of production. They give rise to feudal relations of production, which are characterized by being inextricably bound with personal and extra-economic, that is, uh, political, juridical, and military relations. Now, then we have capitalist property relations, that is, relations between absolute owners and absolute non-owners of the conditions and means of production. And this type of property relations gives rise to capitalist relations of production, that is, um, relations of production that are, that, are, that are primarily constituted by impersonal and strictly economic, not political, relations. Why there is such a difference between feudalism and capitalism, we'll see in the second part of my talk. <coughs> now, such feudal or capitalist class relations, or any class relations for that matter, are intrinsically antagonistic relations, because the extraction of surplus wealth, which is manifested most directly in relations of production, is fundamentally an exploitative, not a reciprocal, relationship. In class societies, the relations of production are antagonistic because they are constituted by two groups of social agents which are situated in the process of wealth extraction in a diametrically opposite way. <laughs> the exploiters are exploiting the exploited because this process of wealth extraction is um, first coercive, second it is functionally arbitrary, uh, it is based on an arbitrary privilege, 
And thirdly, it is strictly one-sided. That is, exploitation is a zero-sum game. Uh, now, all this might seem trivial and even truistic to most of you, but I belabor this point uh, for one important reason only. Namely, it, is, uh, it follows from what I've just said that uh, this social antagonism, the social antagonism that is based on class relations, let's call, let's call it class struggle, is a one-of-a-kind social antagonism. Namely, it is the only relationship that is by definition, that is inherently, antagonistic. Uh, the relation between women and men, for example, can, at least in principle, be either a relation of equality or a relation of inequality, because there is nothing in the nature of the women-men relationship that makes it antagonistic. It is the same with the relation between black and white people. This relationship can, at least in principle, be either a relationship of uh, equality or a relationship of inequality. But the relation between workers and capitalists cannot be anything else but a relation of radical inequality. Capitalists are, by definition, uh, or do, by definition, exist only and insofar as they exploit workers. Capitalists will and can exist only until surplus wealth, in the form of surplus uh, value, is extracted from the immediate producers. Said a bit differently, the women-man relationship, or the black-white relationship, will continue to exist even when the asymmetry that pervades this relationship today will be abolished in the future, hopefully. However, the worker-capitalist relationship still exists the very moment its asymmetry is abolished, because both sides of this relationship are mutually constitutive only in their asymmetry. But okay, let's, let's move on. This dynamic of coercive wealth extraction is the basis upon which antagonistic material interests are formed uh, and are potentially translated either into micro-practices of resistance in the production process or into mass macro-political action. It is by virtue, and this is important, I'll come back to it. It is by virtue of being placed on the exploitative or the exploited class position between class relations that the material interests of an individual social agent are formed. Why? Well, because when an agent is placed at, let's say, the exploited position in the web of class relations, she is going to experience certain life situations or life experiences and not others she will generally experience some form of exploitation, that is, some form of coercive practices that undermine her well-being and autonomy. Capitalists are always, always striving to maximize work output because they are under the pressure of market competition to make workers work as hard as possible. Um, and while workers are resisting this pressure, obviously. So capitalists and workers are, therefore, in a constant, more or less explicit, struggle around employment terms. Workers don't just passively comply with the demands of capitalists. They actively st struggle against them because it is in their interest to defend their well-being and, and autonomy, which exploitation undermines. Here I think it is useful to distinguish, both analytically and ontologically, between two sides. The objective or the necessary side and the subjective or the potential side. The objective side consists of A, the fact of exploitation, and B, antagonistic material interests that are formed by way of this fact of exploitation. Said in other words, if an agent is exploited, if she is under uh, the pressure, of course, of practices of exploitation, it will be in her objective interest to resist such practices. Therefore, the subjective side consists of C, various fragmented micro-practices of resistance in the production process, and D, a fully conscious political mass mobilization of the immediate producers that takes, uh, that takes solidarity and organizing and so on to come about. That means that we can speak of class struggle if at least first three of the above four conditions are met. That is, if there is A, exploitation, and therefore B, antagonistic material interests are formed, and if there is C, at least a minimal recognition of and minimal action in accordance with these material interests on the part of the exploiter. The first two conditions, the, object the objective conditions A and B, form what I call the material core of class struggle. That is, its real basis, independent of the consciousness and action of, of social agents. 
The second two conditions, the subjective ones, C and D, are constitutive of what we could call class formation. That is, either a minimal or fully worked out awareness of interests and either minimal or mass action in accordance with them. As we, see, as we shall see shortly, it is important to stress the fact that exploitation and antagonistic interests that are created by the existence of exploitative practices can and do exist independently of the agents' awareness and ideas of these two phenomena. Marx makes a practically identical claim in The Holy Family when he says, I quote, it is not a question of what this or that proletarian or even the whole proletarian at the moment regards as its aim. It is a question of what the, pro the proletariat actually is. What he says is that the working class is systematically exploited, at least if we accept the conclusions of Marx's critique of political economy, which I think we do, and the material interests of working class agents are in direct opposition with the interests of their exploiters, regardless of whether the agents of the working class are aware of that or not. However, this doesn't mean that at least a minimal awareness of working class interests and at least minimal action in accordance with those interests, namely the first subjective condition C, doesn't follow almost necessarily, almost necessarily, from the, uh, from the two above mentioned objective conditions, that is from the fact of exploitation and from the fact of antagonistic uh, material interests. Why? Well, this is so because as, uh, empirical history and social and psychological research shows time and time again a fundamental part of every social agent, regardless of their culture, uh, is a tendency for at least a minimal recognition of and minimal action in accordance with their basic human needs. Basic human needs such as maintaining some level of autonomy and physical well-being. Now, since class exploitation is inherently coercive and usually detrimental to agents' well-being, it follows that agents will resist exploitation at least minimally wherever it is present. For example, when employers are, try, uh, are trying to drive down wages or intensify work, as, the, as they always do, uh, agents' autonomy and well-being are being undermined. They will, therefore, at least minimally resist such exploitative practices. Such micro-struggles, as, uh, as I call them, at the workplace, uh, struggles that we call the, the subjective condition C are happening all the time. This is indeed what Marx meant by the famous claim uh, that the history of all hitherto existing societies <coughs> is the history of class struggles. Now, there is of course no absolute, no iron law that would uh, necessitate that social agents always and everywhere <coughs> meticulously recognize uh, their interests and act, according, uh, act in accordance with them like some uh, instrumental rationalist automatons. Uh, but from everything we know about the, uh, about the human condition, it is pretty likely that agents will, at least in principle, behave like that. In any case, the least we can say, I think, is the following. I quote here Douglas Porpora. Interests always represent presumptive motives for acting, but actors may fail to recognize their interests and even when they do recognize them, they may choose to act against them in favor of other considerations. However, since when actors fail to act in their interests, they incur some cost, it is expected that actors generally will act in conformity with their interests. Even here, that does not necessarily mean that interests determine specific actions. Actors frequently respond to their structured interests in creative ways that can that can't in principle be uh, in principle be predicted in advance. Okay, so even if we accept what I've just laid out, and I think we must accept this, that is that there exist some basic human needs and interests that are common to all social agents uh, across cultures, and that agents generally do recognize when they are under attack. Even if we accept that, it is impossible to accept that it follows from this rather weak claim about the connection between interests and agents' awareness of them uh, and action of, uh, in uh, accordance with them, that there will uh, emerge a full consciousness of and full action in accordance with uh, their material interests. Class struggle in its strong variant, that is a mass, long-lasting and politically organized mobilization of the working class, is, for very obvious reasons, a great rarity, especially today. For example, competition between workers or gender and ethnic oppression 
that are obviously irreducible to class relations uh, and class struggle are all powerful motivators for workers to be at each other's throats. So it's actually uh, in their immediate interest not to unite and not to collectively struggle against the capitalists and for a socialist revolution. This kind of mass organized class struggle um, requires solidarity. And solidarity is only something that can be built by collective action and meticulous organizing. It does not come about quasi-automatically. However, this does not mean, as most sociologists claim, for example, Ulrich Beck, that class and class struggle don't exist, at least in their minimal form, independently of their political and discursive constitution. Political manifestation of class and class struggle is, as I think we've seen, not a necessary condition of both of these categories. This means that the fact that there usually is no mass politically organized class struggle is uh, not a refutation of the basic Marxian claim about the necessity of class struggle. It is actually the Marxian perspective that emphasizes this connection between social agency and material interests that can most convincingly show us why it is fairly obvious and not all that surprising that such mass politically organized class struggle uh, will be witnessed only very rarely and very momentarily. What the permanence and the necessity of class struggle therefore means is only that agents will usually resist the fact of exploitation on the micro level and in an unorganized, non-political, individual way. Now, before moving on to the second part of my talk, uh, let me just summarize briefly the main points I've made so far. I have claimed that social agents have different vested interests. I have claimed that these interests are distributed amongst agents by virtue of them being placed in different relations between class positions. Furthermore, I have claimed that this is so because by being placed in different class positions, agents are faced with different life situations and different life experiences. Some agents will, experience, will, will face exploit, exploitative practices or experiences, while other agents will enact such practices. It is this latter fact that makes some agents more likely to resist exploitation and others more likely to perpetuate it. Now, as I've said, it does not follow in any way from this that agents must necessarily, that is, mechanically, act in accordance with their vested interests, or that there exists only one homogeneous and easily pursuable set of interests. It only means that certain agents facing certain conditions, certain experiences, will be more likely to act in a certain way. To some of you, again, to most of you, this might seem a trivial and even the most basic of materialist claims uh, that everyone would agree with. But this is actually an important uh, claim, because as we shall see, every post-structuralist would deny the validity of what I just said. Even Anthony Giddens and other advocates of what is called structuration theory, that is the methodological principle that dominates sociology today, and most importantly, sociological departments uh, in the academia, uh, they would disagree. They would reject any notion of human agency being prompted by structural positions or vested interests because for Gibbons and his followers, uh, structures, social structures, have only a virtual, not a real existence. They're only rules and resources that come about when agents instantiate them. Uh, that means that, 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 that uh, structures cannot causally influence, they cannot causally condition agency. Okay, so moving on to the second part of my talk, uh, and here I hope I'll be a bit briefer. As I've said in the beginning, most sociologists and political scientists would protest to my claims here. I think at least two general objections could be made at this point. First, post-structuralist critics and the so-called structuration theorists, such as Anthony Gibbons, would object to the basic materialist claim that we can create material interests from their subjective, that is, political or discursive, articulation by conscious social agents. They would say that interests don't exist uh, ontologically as well as, as uh, analytically, unless and until agents define them. That is, until they are discursively or politically um, articulated. In short, for them, we cannot talk about interests as something that shapes agents' consciousness and action, because to these critics, it is consciousness and action that shapes interests. 
and I'll address this objection in a moment. Um, the second one, and I think a more substantial uh, objection that primarily Weberian sociologists uh, would make uh, against our Marxian theory of class, refers to our claim that class is foremost an economic relation, that it is a social relation between different social positions in the sphere of production. Some Weberians, and interestingly, Max Weber is not amongst them, would even accept such a definition of class for the purposes of analyzing capitalism, but they would emphatically deny that it has any relevance for the analysis of pre-capitalist societies. A noted Weberian sociologist, Anthony Giddens, for example, agrees with Marx and Marxian sociologists that class and class struggle, as we've defined them here, are indeed operative in capitalist societies. However, Giddens says that the Marxian sociologist is completely out of her own when analyzing pre-capitalist societies. There, for Giddens, class as an economic relation, that is, as a relation of production, was not the fundamental structural principle of the society. Rather, it was various forms of power relations that were dominant. In feudalism, feudalism for example, Giddens claims that power relations, such as political and military might, uh, or political and military power, were playing the, the role of the fundamental structural principle of society. In recognizing this, Giddens will continue, the Marxian is at a complete loss, utterly incapable of explaining this fact because for the Marxian sociologist, so he explained, power relations can never be dominant. Only the economy can be dominant. Okay, so what do we make of this Weberian counter-argument? I completely agree with Giddens, as with Marx, that in pre-capitalist societies, the so-called economic relations were not the fundamental structural principle. It is true, as Giddens claims, that political and military power relations were the decisive ones. Now, Giddens thinks this cannot be explained by historical materialism, but this assertion is false. We can see that Giddens is wrong in his critique when we ask ourselves, why is that so? Why are feudalism and capitalism so different in their fundamental structural principle? Here it is, ironically, Giddens who has to use historical materialist explanation, uh, explanations to justify his alleged criticism of historical materialism, namely, it is, as Giddens observes quite correctly, the underlying distribution of property relations that tells us why in capitalism economic relations are the decisive ones and in feudalism, uh, uh, in feudalism political and military power relations are decisive. However, Giddens obviously doesn't grasp that by claiming this, he, he is accepting the primary claim of historical materialism. It is precisely, as I've said in the beginning, the distribution of property relations that tells us what kinds of relations are decisive in particular societies. Because in feudalism, the immediate producers possessed some ownership, some relative ownership over their conditions and means of production. Economic surplus extraction has to be fused with the direct political and military coercion. So political and military power relations were obviously decisive. In capitalism, where the immediate producers are absolutely dispossessed, such interpersonal coercion, political coercion, is not necessary because the dispossessed immediate producers have no other option but to sell their labor power to a capitalist. In capitalism, therefore, power relations, uh, uh, in, in capitalism, therefore, uh, power relations are not, the, are not decisive ones, are not central, because economic ones are, as Giddens himself affirms. Now, by Giddens' own account, it is, as I've said, the distribution of social property relations that determines the fundamental structural principle of any society. Well, this is exactly the central claim of historical materialism, so Giddens' critique of it is profoundly bizarre and confused. In summary, Giddens criticizes historical materialism by invoking the very core principle of historical materialism. We are left to wonder whether Giddens has even read the first chapter of uh, the first volume of Marx's uh, Capital, where Marx himself has spelled out this claim very clearly at the, end, uh, at the end of the chapter. Okay, so there are other aspects, uh, there are other aspects of Giddens' critique of historical materialism that I can't address in my talk, but we can discuss them later. Just to mention them, Giddens' two other famous critiques are um, the critique of methodological holism and the critique of Marxism's alleged functionalism. Giddens claims that Marxism is holist and functionalist and that this is problematic 
because both holism and functionalism are sociologically suspect. Here too, I believe Gibbons is fundamentally mistaken in his critique, because though I wholeheartedly agree that holism and functionalism are sociologically suspect, it is not true that Marxism is holist or functionalist, at least if we are willing to reject or modify quite profoundly Althusserian structuralism and Althusserian Marxism that is based on structuralism. And I think we should do that. Okay, but let me come back to the first objection uh, regarding the independent existence of material interests, and then I'll conclude. Uh, famous post-Marxists uh, such as Ernesto Laclau, Chantal Mouffe, Barry Hindus, Paul Hurst, and Garrett Stephen Jones, all emphatically deny that we can separate, both analytically and ontologically, the objective existence of agencies' material interests from their subjective articulation in discourse. Therefore, our Marxian distinction between what the working class is and what it is aware of is, according to these post-structuralists, bogus and false. This is what Garrett Stephen Jones claims against the Marxian theory of class. I quote, The implicit assumption is of civil society as a field of conflicting social groups or classes whose opposing interests will find rational expression in the political arena. Such interests, it is assumed, pre-exist their expression. However, we cannot decode political language to reach a primal and material expression of interest since it is the discursive structure, in the discursive structure, of political language which conceives of, uh, which conceives of and defines interest in the first place." End quote. Hindus and Hearst claim much the same in their book. They say, objects of discourse don't exist. Entities to which discourse refers to are constituted in it and by it. And the same goes for Chantal Mouffe. She writes, I quote, How can it be maintained? that economic agents can have interests defined at the economic level, since it is in ideology and true politics that interests are defined." End quote. For these theorists, there is, therefore, no link between material conditions, material experiences, and consciousness. But this is the most naive young Hegelian idealism. If we accept these claims, we cannot say that agents facing certain material conditions and experiences will be more likely to develop certain consciousness. Everything is up for grabs, anything goes. Politics and ideology are absolutely autonomous. The only thing that possesses any real power is, ostensibly, discourse. Uh, any one agent can be freely interpolated into any ideological position regardless of their material circumstances, experiences, and interests, purely by the magical powers of discourse. Because for us post-structuralists, the subject is dead. However, claiming that society equals discourse, or that interests are not a material precondition of their potential awareness by social agents, is, at best, a logical fallacy that Roy Bascar has termed the epistemic fallacy. Post-Marxists collapse ontology into epistemology when they are claiming that what holds for our ideas of the world holds necessarily for the world itself. But this is, it should be obvious, pure nonsense. I agree that we have to admit that social agents recognize and articulate their material interests only through ideas and discourse, just as a physicist can explore the universe only through his culturally and discursively permeated conceptual apparatus. However, it does not follow from this in any way that therefore interests or the universe don't exist by themselves, independently of our ideas about them. Okay, so I've come to the conclusion of my uh, talk. Um, I have five seconds left, um, I'll, I'll briefly summarize um, what I've just said, uh, it will be a minute or, or two. Uh, so to summarize, a Marxian theory of class is based upon three types of social relations. Firstly, it is based on social property relations, relations which determine the real, not just the juridical, distribution of the means and conditions of production and the distribution of appropriative power. Secondly, it is based on class relations relations which emerge on the basis of social property relations, at least insofar as the latter are distributed unequally. In other words, unequal social property relations are class relations. Thirdly and lastly, it is based on social relations of production, that is, the relations into which, uh, the, uh, in which the process of wealth extraction is manifested most directly as an experience of exploitation. 
the fact of exploitation which characterizes these relations and the antagonistic material interests which emerge because of the fact of exploitation are, I think, the objective criteria by which classes can be determined. Whether the exploited social agent, uh, whether the exploited uh, social uh, agents will realize their material interests and the fact that they are exploited is a rel relatively open-ended question. There is a whole plethora of ideological, cultural, political, and so on conditions that prevent agents from fully recognizing this fact of systemic expo exploitation and from acting in accordance with it. It follows from this that we can talk of class struggle when the exploited social agents are resisting the fact of exploitation at least minimally. That is, individually, at the workplace, and without a fully worked out socialist consciousness. Now, social agents will generally do this. They will generally resist exploitation, at least in this minimal way, wherever there is exploitation. Because exploitation is necessarily oppressive. It is necessarily coercive. And where there is oppression and coercion, at least a minimal effort to combat it is usually found. Um, so, class struggle, just to finish, is the only social antagonism the material basis of which is a definitional, uh, definitional characteristic of class societies, which means that only class struggle exists as a consequence of the class nature of class societies. Every other social antagonism, which is every bit as important or even more violent and even more frequent as class struggle, can be more or less conjoined to the class nature of society and the class struggle, but it is not a necessary characteristic of class society. Capitalism is, in principle, that is, as a mode of production, compatible with the abolition of gender oppression, racial discrimination, ethnic violence, and so on. But it is not compatible with the abolition of exploitation and class. Exploitation is the necessary and the sufficient condition of the class society. Only the abolition of exploitation implies the abolition of class society. Uh, spirit of talk. Should we thank both of you, to all speakers? Now uh, the floor is open for the discussion. So whatever you wanted to know about class theory, but you didn't know who to ask, I guess now is the opportunity. So just raise your hand. Have a, a comment for Tibor. Um, I don't think it was so much crucial for your argument, but I still think one, one minor point needs a correction. Uh, when you compared uh, class relation to, to racial relation, um, I think you made a mistake because you compared Marx's theory of class relation with a liberal theory or a liberal conception of, of race relation. Uh, you said workers and uh, capitalists are the end result of, uh, of their asymmetrical uh, position in capitalist society, which is true, and I agree with that. But then you said that uh, black, uh, um, even, even if you abolish racial discrimination, you still have black and white people uh, who, can come, uh, who can come into equal relations. Um, and this, this is precisely, I mean, I mean, here you made a mistake, this, this is a liberal position on, on the racial question, on a racial domination, because the race, just as class, is the end result of, of racial ascription, uh, racial segregation, so there is no uh, pure, natural or ahistorical blackness or whiteness, which is then discriminated upon. This is precisely a liberal position, that you have some essential blackness, uh, which is then discriminated, and then you have to raise people's consciousness, and then races will come into harmonious and egalitarian uh, 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 relations with each other. Um, that's quite naive. You, you have to, just as you have to abolish exploitation, to abolish uh, workers and, and capitalists, so you have to abolish racism or racial descriptions, and then even those physiological uh, differences would be completely meaningless because you wouldn't have a social form of race anymore. Uh, so you wouldn't have black and white people, just as now is, for example, the, the physiological fact that you have people with big ears and small ears is completely socially irrelevant. You don't have big eared group of people and small ears, although there is a, a real natural physiological difference. Uh, 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, I want to, I mean, this is an argument that I stole from Alan Mikes's Wood. Um, I, I tried to, I, I'm very saddened by Marxists that try to link uh, various gender, uh, various um, social antagonisms, oppressions with the fundamental, fundamental social antagonism, which is a class struggle. I, I, they are relatively autonomous from each other. Uh, and that is the point I was trying to make, and maybe my, my argument with the, was a bit confused. Uh, I didn't want to imply that um, races are something trans-historically formed and that, uh, we, uh, when, that we could abolish them without abolishing what you said is the social form of race. Of course, I think that we have to do that. I tried to point out that uh, maybe this was connected with my with the last argument I made that only the abolition of class uh, struggle, the abolition of capitalist exploitation, will bring about the abolition of capitalism. All other uh, relations uh, of oppression and antagonism are, at least on the theoretical plane, at the highest level of generality, um, are not connected with class struggle. They dovetail with it um, in the real empirical world when capitalists, um, let's say, are trying to uh, intensify competition between workers so they can uh, hire work workers at a lower cost, uh, they are latch on uh, onto various um, relations of oppression and they um, try, to, try to make workers uh, to be hostile, hostile to each other. But uh, this comes about uh, contingently. Uh, we could, in principle, in theory, and this was the point I was trying to make, and maybe, like I said, I was a bit confused on that, um, we could, in principle, imagine capitalism with no relation of oppression and inequality, uh, but only one relation would have to exist for uh, capitalism to be uh, operative, and that is uh, class struggle, that is uh, exploitation. Of course, such a capitalism is uh, unimaginable uh, at, at more concrete levels, but I think it's an important theoretical analytical distinction uh, so we can avoid class reductionism, uh, if I was clear. Maybe, maybe you could comment a bit more on that. No, I wasn't arguing with your main point. I just wanted to make a, a um, comment on this minor sub point about oh, the comparison. Okay, yes, I agree with that, and maybe I formulated it uh, wrongly. Okay, uh, one relation from someone else. Uh, I have also a couple of uh, very clarificatory follow up questions. I I'd like to uh, dwell a bit on this famous central dilemma of. Uh, on itself versus uh, for itself, the existence of classes that is objective, classes that is subjective, classes that is subjective uh, category, uh, or to put uh, in another way, this uh, dichotomy, structural, theoretical conception of class versus empirical classes as they exist in a self perception of, of, of a society. Uh, now, Chris, I would, I, I would wonder if um, whether we can draw from your uh, talk, maybe a bit forced conclusion, but still that in fact there is not so much missing um, in Marx's uh, account of the classes in capital, in the following sense that um, if we rearrange the parts of the capital a bit, uh, you, show, you showed how uh, we can get an image of the class as the personification of a necessary structural roles, three main necessary structural roles. But then when we come to uh, the empirical classes, for example, I think in this uh, unfortunately last paragraph uh, of the capital, Marx talks about uh, physicians and officials. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have Faith in Brumaire where Marx uh, presents a much more complex uh, structure of class society. Uh, but would you say that not only that are this absent from capital, but it is in fact impossible to come to such uh, to such uh, to such a detailed level um, of class structure uh, purely through the this uh, rigorous categorical analysis? This is characteristic of the capital. Uh, well, I don't want to say it would be impossible. 
certainly take a lot of work. Uh, as for sort of how to do it, and, and the problem between sort of theory and the empirical, as I sort of mentioned as an aside, about sort of bracketing <coughs> the world market, I'll just read that passage, uh, and maybe that can go back to thinking about how this might be done. So this is on page 969, 970. Uh, it's like the second to last paragraph of chapter 48. And, uh, in presenting the reification of the relations of production and the autonomy they acquire vis-a-vis -vis the agents of production, we shall not go into the form and manner in which these connections appear to them as overwhelming natural laws, governing, the, governing them irrespective of their will. In the form that the world market and its conjunctures, the movement of market prices, the cycles of industry and trade, and the alternation of prosperity and crisis prevails on them as blind necessity. Uh, so, I guess I think if such a project was to be attempted uh, to move from this sort of very abstract theoretical level to a more empirical level, uh, it seems like those factors would have to be taken into consideration. As to how to do them, uh, well, maybe someone else has the answer? <laughs> Extra, that there is no need for extra economic constraint, I would 
um, kind of challenge this. This is not only that uh, Marx would say it, or some would say there is certain internal um, limit of Marx's thought for criticizing him not to develop a theory of state, of law, but even within Marx you can read that the transformation to the capitalist mode of production happened with the great force of the state, of law, of repression, and so on and so on. So, so this is one moment. And the second is you are more or less uh, focused on the production, first of the, this property relation, and then you, you went on and on. But there is also a question of reproduction. And once you say a reproduction of the capitalist mode of production, then you already have to have um, all these different levels which are connected also with different levels of class struggle, which can be economic, political, ideological, and so on and so on. And this just to join uh, a small criticism by Primoz that he made. I wouldn't be so much certain that uh, some Marxists try to understand or link together these different struggles, or let's say think about the nexus where class exploitation links with different forms of domination, uh, by, by, be it by uh, uh, gender, be it by, by race and so on. So, of course, we have to understand it in an autonomous way, but on the other hand, it is precisely with the concrete analysis of concrete situation, if you want to say, in Leninist terms, that we can understand where these logics intertwine, how they intertwine and how they even double or expunge themselves. So this would be my contribution. Okay, so first to Jenny. Yes, I agree. Definitely, the ruling class has a better consciousness and there are a couple of reasons for that. I think the most important one is that obviously they have better conditions for collective action. Uh, and this is something uh, about which uh, Vivek Chiber is uh, brilliant uh, about. I mean, uh, he, his analysis of uh, how class struggle manifests itself uh, as a conscious class struggle, that is, that uh, last condition D, um, that when capitalists and workers struggle at, at the level of the production process or uh, at the political level, it is capitalists who always have the advantage. Their, their structural advantage, if nothing else, is that they possess basically all the wealth in the society. And because of that, it is not difficult for them to, um, to, to have collective action. To, um, when workers go on strikes, for example, uh, it is very hard for workers to be in solidarity with each other. They have nothing to eat. They, when, they go, they, when they go on strike, uh, they don't get paid. And how can people that have four kids and a shitty job already, and no savings, how can they struggle uh, in, a, uh, some, in such a uh, strike for two weeks? Well, for capitalists, it's pretty easy. They sit back and they say, let's see who, who will hold, hold out the longest. I can wait. I can wait two months. You can't wait three days because your children will start. So um, this is one of, the, one of the issues. They have immensely better conditions. There, are, there is more of us, but uh, they have all the wealth. Um, now, there are, of course, other um, issues involved here. One of them is that it is not so one-sided. Even capitalists, they compete between each other uh, all the time. So competition is something that is uh, on our side. Uh, because, uh, as we see, when workers strike, and they think this is how strikes uh, should be, if they can be organized, uh, when they connect, um, Across, across sectors, across um, uh, different um, jobs and so on, uh, w w they can exert pressure on the capitalists uh, by uh, striking the, at the same time e uh, in the same or, well, different uh, sectors. And then uh, capitalists themselves, uh, as, a, as a class um, organized and, consciousness, uh, and conscious agent, will uh, sit down and talk to each other uh, and will try to pursue each other uh, to make some concessions to the workers so they stop striking because one capitalist, one capitalist can be uh, hit more by strikes than the other. And so they are, as, as you pointed out in your uh, lecture, a band of hostile brothers. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's a very dynamic um, 
picture. Uh, there they have much uh, better conditions uh, than we do uh, for class consciousness and class struggle. But uh, in the end, uh, there is more of us, and uh, not everything is so uh, one-sided. Uh, regarding the middle class, I agree that. Um, one of the primary issues with a Marxian theory of class is that it was unable, uh, most of the time, to locate, uh, to identify, to theorize uh, classes between uh, those these two uh, great classes, between capitalists and workers. There are many attempts, like Perkadis and uh, Pulantzas and uh, Eric Pulin Wrights and so on, and I think they all fail on different levels. Uh, although they are very incisive on different levels. Um, and, I mean, it is very, uh, it is very symptomatic, uh, the works of Eric Olin Wright, how he struggles uh, when he is oscillating. I mean, he has been oscillating for 30 years between the Berian and Marxian theories of class. He's constantly trying to suppress Marx in his works, and now, uh, I mean, from the 70s on, and uh, now he had an article uh, in the New Left Review a couple of years back when he kind of admitted, okay, we can't, we can't do without the Berian class theory. We have to inte integrate the two. Well, I don't think so. I agree with you that the, the Berian notion of the middle class is, it has nothing to do with what Marx, uh, Marxists uh, talk about when they talk about class relations. Uh, status is something that is non-relational. Status is uh, something that does not have any inherent antagonism inherent dynamic between it, uh, in it. Uh, if we dis the, define different middle classes and uh, we have different strata of what? Uh, top managers and then we have a lower strata of salaried professionals and a lower strata of precarious workers and so on. If we define them by their um, income differentials, as Giddens does, um, as, uh, sorry for the slip, uh, Eric Olin Wright does, uh, at least implicitly, um, or some Marxists do uh, explicitly, and the Berians do explicitly, I don't know uh, if this can be anything more than a classificatory, uh, descriptive category. Um, stratification theories based on income differentials don't explain anything. They can be helpful uh, for, as a description, but they don't explain anything. They don't explain any dynamic in society. If uh, some group of social agents uh, receives a salary in, of 1,000 1, euro, euros and another group uh, a salary uh, in, uh, of 100, uh, 1,500 euros. Okay, so what did we explain by that? Uh, is there any struggle between them? How are they qualitatively different? They are not. Um, so, so to answer your question more concretely, I think that we have to theorize um, different uh, strata, problematic strata, what uh, Wright calls contradictory class positions. I would uh, say that two such groups of social agents are present today and that we have to theorize them uh, more concretely. And this is uh, top managers and salaried professionals. Why? Top managers, in contradistinction distinction with uh, capitalists, don't possess any real uh, means of production. They possess them only formally, only juridically. And I said that juridical notions of distribution of means of, of distribution of means of production is, is problematic. So this is uh, one problem. The second one uh, regarding the salaried professionals, um, like people in academia, uh, those of course, those uh, few that have uh, um, job, um, job security and long-term employment and so on, that are relatively privileged, at least in times of uh, economic booms, they are relatively, or more or less, um, absent from market competition and I wouldn't, I don't know if I can say that they experience exploitative practices. Well, if they do, there is no problem. But I don't know how deans um, of universities exploit, um, uh, um, experience exploitative practices. Um, okay, so to Gal, uh, yes, um, regarding the, uh, the, that notion of um, uh, regarding the notion about uh, extra economic relations, I agree. Uh, I, I did not want to uh, displace them. They are very important, and not only are they important, they are integral to a capitalist mode of production, but in a fundamentally different way. If extra economic relations were um, manifest most directly outside of the labor process in feudalism, where uh, the lords of the manor had to come, to uh, the immediate producers, to the peasants, and um, force them 
uh, with uh, knives and armies and so on to um, relinquish their surplus product. Uh, this is obviously not so in capitalism. In capitalism, uh, everybody has to sell their labor power or they would die on the street. But this does not mean that there is no extra economic uh, coercion. It is, but it has been shifted from outside the labor process to within. Within the labor process, where capitalists have, have to extract more and more surplus wealth when they intensify work and so on, there is this um, interpersonal coercion, which I think should be uh, is what uh, which I which I think is what um, makes possible uh, this claim that wherever there is exploitation, people will resist it. Precisely because it, even in capitalism, these uh, exploited, exploitative practices are interpersonal in nature. However, it is important to separate. Uh, I think you you see where I'm going uh, between these two, um, two locations of extra economic relations. And just to finish um, uh, regarding the moment of transformation, yes, of course I agree. Primitive accumulation is something uh, without which capitalism cannot exist. So it is even more radical. Capitalism comes about. Uh, by extra economic coercion, and it is perpetuated by extra economic, uh, extra economic coercion, but in a different way uh, than feudalism. Uh, obviously, it's enough. Chris, uh, whatever you want to So, we have, yes, we have two more questions now. First, uh, my name is Gregor, and I would like to um, ask Tibor to um, some few questions. Um, maybe first a very basic question, how do workers know that they are being exploited? Do they figure themselves does, uh, or does someone else tell them that they are being exploited and that their situation is a situation in which their interests are being undermined and, uh, and so on. And then um, furthermore, I would just maybe uh, I would ask more practical questions. For example, how do you explain cultural differences and on work uh, places, such as, for example, in, between the United States and China? Because if you would put American uh, worker in China in those large factories, probably they wouldn't last for very long. Because in, in, th in their culture, uh, autonomy, um, and individualism is valued very high on, on their uh, value scale. So, but on the other hand, you have Chinese culture, Confucianism, which values uh, rule abiding and following uh, um, uh, instructions and so on. And so probably if you would put Chinese worker in America, he would feel lost. And, and so how do you explain these, these, uh, these cultural differences? And because probably quite a lot of Chinese workers don't feel exploited, even though they work in a very bad conditions, um, and, and, and American uh, worker would feel very quickly exploited in, in China. And then how do you explain also um, differences between people in the same culture? For example, that we all maybe hear that individuals choose their professions according to their wish uh, uh, whether or not they want to be more autonomous or whether or not they want to work somewhere where they just receive rules and they comply to them and they receive the salary and they go, they go home. But some people uh, would feel very oppressed, uh, very oppressed if they couldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to be more creative for example, if they, if they uh, wouldn't be able to you know, be very autonomous and express themselves individually on the workplace. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah you, that's it, that's it. Yeah. Uh, and now, Stephen. Thank you. Um, one, uh, just one point for the debut. Um, so I agree with, I really agree with the statement that, oh yes, capitalism is um, objectively <coughs> Antagonistic in character, as you have uh, shown. There is culture will always and ev uh, everywhere it's constituted the very, the very process of its reduction and, uh, and so on. But on the second point is when you suggest that this, um, this uh, exploita exploitation is um, uh, um, transparent in, in, in 
some sort. I mean, uh, you said people experience, material experience of exploitation, which leads them and so on and so on. But here we could mm, uh, uh, return to Chris and, and to the Trinity formula and uh, say, well, what the wage war does is basically it mystifies uh, uh, exploitation. And Barks emphatically says, um, in the context of the Trinity formula, that this is where all the, the, both the workers and the capitalists derive most of their notions of fairness and so on and so on. So, uh, not to forget this, this is like, uh, when we, talk, uh, we are skipping these and the ideological reasons. But I think uh, to have a, um, uh, that this step is missing, that we will always have to, um, uh, to include how the things necessarily appear in capitalism, and that this is what, what makes um, certain ideological interpolations or narratives more or less possible to workers and, and, uh, and people capitalists. Um, so this is something, especially from a political perspective, which we always have to bear in mind, and especially when you say interest, objective interest. Well, capitalism works basically because it, 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 um, it produces, as you have suggested at a certain point, uh, that this immediate material dependence, this dependence on the wage form, uh, um, makes it rational, you know, the, the interest of the worker to sell his labor power. So this dependence is, uh, in, in the short term, interest is the, uh, his interest may be precisely what is against his um, objective uh, long term interest, if you talk about uh, revolution and so on. And all of these, so these are the things that complicate a bit uh, this, uh, what it seems to me at, 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 in certain uh, points, your formulation seems a bit too, too, um, too mechanistic in terms of translating objective uh, 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 relations well, immediate experiences. Okay. Okay, so these two questions or comments were pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, I have a quick question. So we have, we can have a... Okay, I'd like to I have a short comment. I think uh, some of the issues were uh, already uh, uh, pointed out. Uh, what it seems to me, Tibor, uh, is that you have this distinction between modes of uh, production and uh, power relations, and you separate the, the two of them, and then you, you have uh, you explain how they enter into the mode of production. And that's why you have this distinction of, I don't know, feudalism had a particular type of exercising power, and then you have capitalism. Uh, so, but I think. Uh, uh, and no, the mode of production somehow uh, comes at, at the end of uh, exercising power. And I think that's the way you actually started the presentation, describing uh, the setting of, um, of the society, the feudal society, or the feudal society, as an uh, end result of a distribution process. And somehow this, this remains, remains uh, unexplained in, uh, in uh, the way you conceptualize uh, class relations afterwards. And I think that, that puts you in a, uh, puts your theoretical uh, take in a, a really uh, sort of mechanistic uh, relation between uh, these two antagonistic classes. And I think that's, that's a little bit problematic precisely because by not uh, uh, seeing the power relations internal to the uh, mechanism itself, uh, you cannot trace this uh, shifting uh, position within uh, these two antagonistic classes, which I think is very correct to emphasize that it's the most fundamental Antagonism. But in between this antagonism, precisely because it is placed in a, a particular power uh, field, there are shifting positions. There are antagonistic interests, objective antagonistic interests, but there are also shifting positions which would allow them to um, differentiate better uh, structured class positions. For example, I don't know, would you put police uh, that is, you know, um, relatively low paid but uh, paid by the state to exercise power for the class and so on. So we have different um, questions of uh, class position that the middle class that was brought up, but you can imagine others as well, uh, that, are, uh, that are part of the antagonistic, uh, structural antagonistic position, but very shifting. So, okay, uh, so a couple of points came up. Um, first of all, uh, to the first question, uh, it was said that people in the East don't think the same as people in the West. I think that Vivek Chibber's latest book, The Post-Colonial Theory of the Spectre of Capital, showed quite brilliantly that this is completely false. I agree that different cultures value different things. This is, of course, the fact of life. But 
what Chiber claims, and here, here I, agree, I agree wholeheartedly with him, and I think that any materialist account of that, uh, uh, materialist account of sociology has to admit what I'm about to say, is that culture doesn't go all the way down. Social agents are constituted by more than just culture, ideology, politics, and discourse. There exist some basic human needs that extend across localities and cultures. Every social agent on this planet has a, a basic human need, at least two basic human needs. Um, there is a, a need for autonomy and physical well-being. What Chibber, what Chibber argues in his book is that there never was, there never existed a culture uh, that would erase or displace a, this, such a basic human need. No culture can exist, and it never did exist, which would erase uh, the recognition uh, on the part of social agents of their need for uh, physical well-being. Because this need, the recognition and the satisfaction of this need is a basic precondition for the emergence of culture. So every culture would, would disappear if it, it managed to erase uh, such a basic human need. Uh, so, yes, I agree that uh, Chinese workers think very differently than Slovenian workers or German workers or any other workers, but they do share something in common. Their basic need for autonomy and uh, this uh, self-reproduction, physical uh, well-being. It is this that makes us, um, that, that makes us, uh, that, uh, that we, with which we can, um, with which we can go against post-structuralist notions of uh, moral relativism. P precisely because all social agents share certain uh, qualities, certain characteristics, we can say that um, it is objectively right that their autonomy and well-being are not uh, undermined. Um, this is, of course, a great obstacle for class struggle. It is a great obstacle for uh, the struggle for socialism and so on. It is very hard to um, that uh, Chinese workers and Slovenian workers would uh, come together uh, through solidarity and so on, because they don't speak the same language, they don't share in the same religion and so on. Uh, it is extremely difficult for, their, for them to be in solidarity, but it is what we have to work with. Uh, and this fact that um, we require solidarity, precisely because people are different, however, they are not different all the way down, um, is what makes the socialist pro project uh, such an uh, ambitious task. Um, Stipe, uh, you said that I say, and you're wrong here, that exploitation is transparent. Uh, it might have come across like that, but I, I tried to deny that um, a couple of times. I, I don't say that exploitation is transparent. I just say, and this dovetails with what I just said, that exploitation is a course of practice. And uh, when you are exploited, um, you, you're, you're being coerced, and if you're coerced, your autonomy and consequently your well-being are being undermined. Uh, if that is true, uh, and if what I say about human needs is true, then you will at least minimally recognize this. When you will be, uh, where you're, where, when you are beaten or when you are uh, extorted uh, in the labor process, uh, you feel that. You feel that, you definitely don't recognize it automatically as capitalist exploitation and so on, uh, and the, the structural uh, inequalities and uh, the, the need for socialist revolution, but you feel uh, that somebody is exploiting you, uh, that your autonomy and well-being are being undermined, and, um, uh, and because, of, because of that, you will resist such uh, practices. Um, so yes, it, it is definitely it is mystified. Exploitation is mystified uh, in, in the way that Chris talked about. Uh, but again, this doesn't go. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, this just doesn't go all the way down. Um, it is not absolutely mystified. There are there, there is a small leeway uh, for it to be recognized and worked upon uh, by organizing collective action and so solidarity and so on. Uh, okay, the last thing uh, about modes of production and power relations. Um, no, I, I, I definitely see power relations as internal to class struggle. I definitely uh, analyze societies through this concept of mode of production. I just uh, try to say, and this is, uh, wasn't Bolivar, the first one who came up with this, I mean, it was Marx, uh, who at the end of the chapter, uh, the first chapter, one in one of Capital wrote against some, some of his critics, um, that 
uh, it, uh, somebody said against Marx that in uh, ancient society it was politics that played the dominant role, and uh, in the Middle Ages it was uh, Catholicism that played the dominant role. Uh, and yes, today it is economics, but usually, uh, but in pre-capitalist mode of production, uh, it was other um, types of uh, well. Marx argues against this that of course. It was, there were power relations and politics and Catholicism that were dominant. However, why were they dominant? Because of the matrix of the distribution of property relations. He says how people got their life, how they reproduced themselves, that explains why here economy and their politics is dominant. And this is the Bolivarian uh, notion that what the economy is determined in the last instance, uh, and that means that the economy, relations of production, uh, determine the, the distribution of social property relations, determine uh, which sphere of, um, of society will be dominant. Will it be the econ uh, economy, will it be the uh, um, political sphere, and so on. Uh, I'm being asked, asked to uh, conclude, so sorry if I was.